So morning, everybody. My name's Emma Lindley. I'm co-founder of Women in Identity. And as you heard earlier on today, everything we're going to be talking about on this stage today is all going to be about trust and about identity. Now, what do we mean by trust and what do we mean by identity? We've just heard Brian Cox giving his view on what he thinks his trust is. But those are two very, very subjective and very contextual words, trust and identity. I want you just to take a moment to think in your terms, when I say the word trust and the word identity, what that means to you. Perhaps if you work in the banking environment, you think about trust, you say, well, I want to trust my customers. I want to know that they're not a fraudster. If we think about identity in the banking context, we might be thinking about KYC. But let me give you another context to give you a view on why these, these subject matters are so difficult to actually pin down. Imagine you're going to your doctor. You've got an ailment. You want to know that you can trust your doctor. You want to know their identity. You want to know that they're an actual doctor. So you need to know their credentials. That context is very different. Now, arguably, everything about, we know about trust and identity in today's systems is broken. People talk about it being broken. I'd argue, actually, that it was never actually fixed in the first place. If we think about going back to the days when the internet was developed, people weren't thinking about trust and identity. They were thinking about communication. And if we roll forward a number of years to where we are today in open banking, People were thinking about how do we make data open, not about trust and identity. So I hope today's speakers are going to give you some hope, some hope that we can fix trust and identity, their view on what trust and identity is. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our first speaker, who is going to be talking all about the future of identity and what that holds. Don Thibault is the chairman of the Open Identity Exchange and the Open ID Foundation. They're both not-for-profit organizations involved in developing standards in this world of trust and identity. Don, give me a round of applause. Good morning. I was just thinking about a conversation that I had with my wife the other day on the way to a dinner party. As we were approaching, she got quiet, and I said, what is it? And she said, you're not going to talk about identity tonight, are you? And I said, what's wrong? She says, it's just so boring. So what I'd like to do is to talk about identity, the future of identity, in kind of a context that I remember Bill Gates saying is that he's got lots of experts offering him advice about the marketplace in five years. So what I'd like to do today is to try and take us from where we are now to that five-year horizon and take you on this journey of identifying, defining, and building functionality into trust and identity. And trust and identity are wicked problems. The 10,000 people that are here today, each would have their own definition of trust, and each would have a valid way of expressing identity. That cultural context, the community bias, is very difficult for us to get work done. Just when you think you have a definition of identity, it's like a wet bar of soap. It pops out. One of the things that is true of identity and access management solutions in this space is that once they're solved, they become more brittle over time. That's certainly the case with knowledge-based authentication or SMS messaging that were the part of this then of identity and security. Those tools and techniques are no longer as secure as they once were. And certainly, passwords are, for many breaches and many threats, the threat vector of choice. Passwords are the cockroaches of the identity ecosystem. 
so we're in a we're world where the solutions are not bad or good. They simply are not true or false. They are always evolving as regulations change, as best practices are instituted. And we have to constantly look at what I call the holy trinity of identity. Anti-money laundering, know your customer, and legal entity identity. Each of these standards, these tools and techniques are constantly evolving and being replaced by new opportunities. Identity is boring. No one's ever become a CEO of their organization because they knew a lot about identity. Identity is a cost center. It lacks the sex appeal of a profit, profit and loss business unit. Its identity is condemned to being this horizontal function that cuts across enterprises. So my wife was right. Identity is boring, but identity is like plumbing. Done right, it's indispensable. Done right, it's invisible. Now we know what happens when we get identity wrong, when we get trust wrong. The kinds of breaches and identity theft really bring hell to pay. Identity systems, once broken, are expensive to fix. And like plumbers, they're hard to find. So my modest goal today, just this few minutes that we have together, is to see if we might be able to come to a common view of what identity is and how trust can be made functional, can be actionable within our enterprises. So real quickly, I'd like to talk about how we might instrument or architect trust and identity. How we know when a partner, an employee, a network is safe, is trustworthy. How we know the identity of people that we've never met and never contracted with. How we can protect the privacy and security of the user and still deliver a compelling user experience. So the context for our conversation is this notion that we have to operate in a zero trust environment. Best practice is you trust no one, not your employees, not your partners, not your suppliers, not your networks. How can we operate in a never trust but always verify context? It forces us to rethink who and how and when we trust. It's a game changer. But as we sit here today, billions of dollars are being transacted by the worst, most untrustworthy actors that we have. Billions of dollars flow through the dark web, the pornographers, the arms dealers, the drug dealers, are somehow able to transact with each other in a global ecosystem. How is that possible? How is that speed and velocity? How is that volume and variety of goods being transacted in the most quintessentially untrustworthy environment? It turns out that the dark web, and I think the next five years of work in trust and identity, are going to be built on a concept of trust that is transactional. That we are trusting of someone or something or some group when we can reliably and repeatedly transact with them. That's our operational definition of, of trust. What we want to be able to do is to find the technical tools and legal rules that constitute the basis of trust. It turns out that we've had trust mechanisms for a long time, both in the credit card networks and in simple listings of identity data. The simple transference, even in an analog context, like a phone book, allows us to find a trustworthy transaction. We can find information about suppliers, who they are, where they are, and how to contact them on a reliable and repeatable basis long before the internet 
was um, created. This trans notion of transparency is at the root of what trust and trusted transactions are. Of course, in the internet age, we now have automated discovery. That phone book now is expressed in terms of the networks that power the internet, the SWIFT networks, etc. This discovery of who we're doing business with, how we're doing business, like the DNS network, is exponentially valuable. It leverages identity data in a way that we've never seen before. It's created trillions of dollars of value. If you think about these high volume, high variety, high velocity trading networks, I think the future of identity will look something like this, where we have the New York Stock Exchange, the Hang Sen, the FTSE, each creating a collaborative environment where competitors can compete on a level playing field. They're made possible by a series of technical standards and the requirements of the players to be in conformance with those standards and a series of legal rules or governance that requires them to comply with both the rules of the exchange as well as that of the regulator. The great achievement that we have in financial services is that not only each of these networks work at scale, but they're now knit together on a global network of networks. I think we're gonna see attribute exchanges and identity data begin to follow the same path. Registries aren't new, but registries build trust through transparency. Registries of events, of actors in action, and in so identifying those events and actors and actions, we can begin to look at liability in this context where in identity management systems, each of the actors can take liability on for that set of duties that are represented in bilateral agreements, service level agreements, and this new beast called schemes or trust frameworks. Registries, as you know, are at the heart of the new architectures here in Europe, where GDPR, PSD2, and open banking require national registries to provide the transparency so that this automated discovery and this trust can be derived. These national registries in EIDAS are then integrated for a pan-European marketplace, then integrated once again in the next three to five years in a more global system. So the great disruption and the great opportunity of open banking, the forcing function of GDPR and PSD2, is that we're beginning to find trust mechanisms that scale, trust mechanisms that drive transactions at a high volume, velocity, and variety. And we have to create these systems that are interoperable with a wide set of devices. We know that whatever we do in open banking, however the regulations of PSD2 settle out, the platform of choice is that mobile device. So it requires us to stitch together a series of technical standards, working with regulators to understand the legal guidance so that we can create governance for these exchanges, for these registries, for these directories. It's when we have the interoperability both across systems and along different devices, networks and display devices that we'll be able to find the solutions to trust and identity. That's our goal. We know that we've got it right if we're able to measure trust and to understand identity in terms of the volume, velocity, and variety of these transactions. So these technology tools, these legal rules, that's the one piece that I'd like you to take away from this conversation, is that this is a sophisticated audience. We can't leave trust, we can't leave identity 
to the coders and developers, nor can we leave them exclusively to the, pro to the province of lawyers and regulators. It is the then of identity that is going to take us from where we are into the future. This spans across business sectors, both public and private. We have in the airline industry, one of their highest priorities is their One Identity Initiative. That One Identity Initiative is born not from increased airline passenger travel, but simply the notion of how do we protect that customer journey from a security point of view? How do we deliver a seamless experience in the airport so that we can accommodate the security, the privacy of tra travel data, and that experience? So what I'd like you to visualize, if you would, this Venn of what I call open banking and open identity. What is common to both those ecosystems, those marketplace and those industry leaders, are these sets of problems. The regulatory barriers are increasingly under pressure. We have a situation where regulation may fix a problem at a time for one jurisdiction, but has this effect, this Doppler effect throughout the world's global ecosystem. We have no clarity on cost of identity systems because we've never thought of them as a unit, as a function unto itself. Standards tr trump regulations. I use that middle word deliberately. The big news in the US from a regulatory action point of view is the recent fine of Facebook. For years of privacy violations, for years of stonewalling the government, regulators in the US required Facebook to write a check for $5 billion. The result of that was that Facebook's stock shot up the next day. It wasn't that the agreement was flawed, although it did give retrospective immunity to Facebook for all their previous sins, but it simply missed one thing, a zero. If it were 50 billion, even the CEO of Facebook would have felt it. If it were 50 billion, the shareholders and stakeholders in Facebook would have taken notice. So my point is that in the next five years, in the identity ecosystem, in this Venn of open banking and open identity, the role of standards is going to become increasingly important. The ability of regulators in one country to impact behavior on a global basis is diminishing. Regulators don't have the agility, the expertise, or the capacity to drive the kind of systemic change that they'd like. So this notion of standards is one that I take a bit of a deeper dive in. And if you take, uh, go with me on this journey, I'd like to point out one particular standard, which I think is the linchpin to this open identity open banking piece. We know that open standards are at the basis of how the internet works, the basis of how credit card systems work, the ability for multiple parties to have a singular contract that provides the legal rules and the technical specifications for those systems is critical. Open standards are at the basis of this growth of trusted transactions. It's at the basis of the user experience to say nothing of how systems scale and interoperate. Open standards like OpenID Connect, which most of you are using, if you're a Microsoft user, a Google user, dozens of platforms, OpenID Connect has taken the place of the SAML standard. It's offering a new set of opportunities for higher value transactions that we'll talk about in a minute. 
It's the result of a team of rivals making a simple conclusion that there are some things that even the most powerful companies cannot do by themselves. So that one standard, that piece in the ven of open identity and open banking, is a brand new standard called the Financial API. It's being developed in the OpenID Foundation, a nonprofit, technology agnostic, global organization that offers up this standard at no cost and no license fee. What's significant about this financial API is that it is built on top of OpenID Connect, and it is being developed in conjunction with what's called the Moderna standard, a mobile identity standard led in part by the GSMA and other actors so that we begin to align these standards being developed for identity, for mobility, and for financial services. An interesting thing happened at the financial API working group. As they were beginning to launch its first set of standards, the name changed. The name changed from the financial API to the financial grade API. What was that all about? It was the realization of the leaders in that working group, Microsoft, Nomura, Intuit, other fintechs, other banks, that if this financial API, this open standard, actually got adopted and actually was trustworthy, it would create a dynamic that basically went like this. If that authentication standard is good enough for banks, it'll be good enough in healthcare, it'll be good enough in airlines, it'll be good enough in the gaming industry. So we have now the very beginnings of what I think over the next five years is going to be a central standard for securing financial grade trusted transactions online. We have now hundreds of companies that have certified their conformance to that standard. Again, boring stuff this is, but it really is the catalyst for change in our ecosystem. Now, I'm a standards guy. I don't want to oversell it. We all know that standards are only as good as their adoption. And their adoption is a, fun is a function of how trustworthy they are. Well, how do we know they're trustworthy? Show me the proof. We have, for a long time, looked at certification from an auditing perspective, a consulting perspective. But that doesn't scale. To be sure, there's an important role for that third-party audit, those certification regimes and the organizations that provide that surety and trustworthiness. But it doesn't scale. We need to have a new way of self-certifying technical conformance to this new standard and demonstrating legal compliance to both regulations and the governance systems within different networks. So what we've done is that we've innovated this notion of self-certification. Here's how it works. Any organization, at any time, at no cost, can look up the requirements for self-certification to the financial grade API standard. Two things happen. When they're ready to apply for that certification, they show their work. They show the logs of how their deployment, how their system and solution conforms to the standard. They make it publicly available at no cost for the world to see. With that, three things are triggered. You can be sure that when Google self-certified its conformance to OpenID Connect, Facebook and Apple and Microsoft went through that code with a fine-tooth comb. You can be sure that we have this na global neighborhood watch where developers around the world were able to see exactly how that implementation 
of that deployment or product or solution conform technically to the standard. So we have peer review, we have this worldwide crowdsourcing of examination of technical compatibility, and we have it trusted because we have it available for anyone to see at any time. But that's not enough. The technical conformance piece is not sufficient for trust. What we need to do is ask those organizations that when they publish those results, they need to put the most important asset they own on the line, which is their brand. So in addition to the technical results, a officer of that organization makes a legal statement saying that those results are in fact representative of my product, my solution, my deployment at this time. In the states that invites class action suits, but it, here it gives us the instrumentation of trust for these identity systems, the tools and the rules, the conformance from a technical point of view and the compliance from a legal and regulatory point of view. We have something that scales on a global basis. We have something that allows new fintech players, challenger banks, existing banks, to be able to invest in these new standards, these open banking, these open identity standards, and create trust and trusted transaction on a global basis. So these two components, I think, allow us to drive trust in new ways, allow us to scale identity systems on a global basis, and provide the trust layer necessary for both conformance to identity standards and the financial grade APIs that now are at the heart of open banking standards. And by that I mean that this financial grade API standard has been adopted by the open banking implementation entity here in the UK. That security profile, that standard, is one piece of a bundle of requirements for conformance to open banking regulations and for interoperating on a technical basis with these systems that are in flux, that are evolving before our very eyes. I'm pleased to say that the Financial Data Exchange, a new organization in the US created by FSISAC for the sole purpose of sorting out identity. So we have among the nine major banks in the UK the creation of a special purpose entity that looks at standards, that looks at, at the security profile for open banking and has this connection to identity systems. The UK has adopted that. The Financial Data Exchange, a special purpose identity organization in the US has said the same thing. We expect and we're trying hard to reconcile those differences between how the financial API standard operates in a PSD2 environment and how those standards can be adopted on a global basis. The Japanese Bankers Association, our Australian counterparts are all looking at how these open standards that touch identity and banking can be adopted within national registries and national directories. If we get it right, we'll create this global interoperability for that piece. Now surely each jurisdiction, each regulator will add on what they think is fit for purpose within their environments. But we have in this open standard and this self-certification the opportunity to do things best. So what does the world look like in five years? I think that we're going to be seeing the certification program be part of not only the organizations that are constituent members of these consortiums and networks, but are going to be built into the transparency provided by national registries. And I think we'll begin to see global directories that will be transparent to drive the trust necessary for the transaction environment that we have. 
we're beginning to see a new world of attribute exchanges. What do I mean by an attribute? Or let me define identity for you. The way I think of identity is it's a label on a bag. It's a bag of attributes. If you're in California and you shake that bag, you'll hear coins clinking. Because no other environment better than Silicon Valley has monetized identity attributes and identity data better than that environment. So we're looking at a ecosystem that is characterized by these frameworks, by the architecture that we've borrowed from the past, that's been successful in the credit card system, that's been successful at SWIFT networks, that's been successful in the DNS world. We're using these kinds of transparency devices, these trust mechanisms, to drive the kind of change that we're looking for. So the then of open banking and open identity is one that I'd like you to take away. It's a, a lens that I suggest that you can look at the technology solution sets that you're building, that your companies are architecting, the suppliers are offering, and try this out, which is when you're talking to the technical people, ask them about standards. When you're talking to the lawyers, ask them about certification and conformance, because it's only when we're able to connect using the API economy that's emerging that we can create ecosystems that work for all. Privacy is dead. Now, I know it's like a skunk at a garden party, but I suggest to you, this sophisticated audience, that you know about big data, you know about data analytics, you know about the business models that monetize data about us and what we do. If you know that, you know that there is very little opportunity to protect or keep private data that we create, data that we might own about us. You can't live online and protect that data in any sufficient way. So I'd like to suggest a change in vocabulary, that we replace the privacy discussion with this notion of agency. And if you look at the heart of the new regulatory environment that we will live in, that we are living in now, a PS2 environment, an open banking environment, a GDPR environment, an EIDAS environment, at, this, at the center of that, to my mind, is this notion of agency. Give me control. Give me a right to consent to how data that is about me, data that I create, and the metadata that is monetized around me, give me a better mechanism for control than a toss agreement where it's one and done. So this notion of agency, I think, is one of the ways that will drive the development of both the technology as it has the regulation, where our opportunity is control, where our ability to participate in the systems that monetize, that monitor, and that drive our behavior are returned to us in a way that is both legally meaningful and practically important. We need to find new mechanisms beyond the one and done toss agreement that gives this agency back to the citizen, the customer, and the user. Not because that's the right thing to do, it is, but it's a necessary thing to do because we need trust. The trust that comes from systems that involve you in a consent way. All of you have a trust framework or a scheme in your pocket. All of the credit cards in your wallet are a manifestation, instantiation of a set of scheme rules, legal requirements, contractual requirements, regulatory requirements, aligned and integrated carefully with a set of technical standards driving how 
people, places, and things can be exposed in these kinds of systems. So privacy is dead is my way of hooking you and asking you to begin to think about these conversations in this new way. Open banking, open identity is all about agency. They're a phenomenon that are driven not by the technology, not by the regulators, but that compelling user experience that can come when a customer trusts you, when a customer is confident that a transaction can occur that they're a part of. Thank you very much. Thanks, Don. Take a seat. Um, I am not going to let you leave the stage uh, because you've just said the immortal words, privacy is, uh, is dead. Now, for a lot of people in the audience, they've probably been living and breathing GDPR for the last couple of years. So to tell them that privacy is dead, um, just explain what you mean by that. There is no better place to be than right here, right now, because we're in the UK and in Europe trying to develop a third model. Francois Macron said that the identity or data world, the internet world, is really characterized by two poles. The Chinese model of state-sponsored identity. You are granted the, your identity by the state and you are monitored along those lines. The other model is the California model, the wild, wild west model where identity data is monetized to the fairly well. What can occur here in Europe, and most likely what will have to occur here in the UK first, is the development of some third way that respects the rights and the obligations of the individual while creating these highly valuable networks. So when you talk about um, you know, some kind of third way, in Europe, arguably, you know, a number of the countries in Europe have developed and established digital identity schemes like the ones that you were talking about. So if we look to Estonia, X-Road, if we look to the Nordics, Bank ID, QPass, that type of thing in, in the Nordics, where do they fit in all of this that you're talking about? And is that the type of scheme that you're talking about? Well, I think it's one model. I think it's the traditional model where identity is a function of a government fiat. In common law countries, the US, the UK, and others, we have to look for another way of creating consent models, um, providing agency that comes not as a dictate of the government, or we don't wait for it to come from, from corporations, but can be the result of these two poles, these two forces that work. It is not easy. There are three things that you don't want to see being made. Legislation, sausage, and standards. And the standards inherent in GDPR or PSD2, and even open banking, were at the very beginning of a very long process of that kind of sausage making. OK, I've got one last question for you. So if you were to summarize you know, the top three things that you think are going to be the future of identity, you know, say let's look forward the next five years, what would you say those, those need to be, particularly for, for Europe? I think we're going to see enterprises begin to um, blur that line between enterprise and, um, uh, com uh, and individual applications. I think we're going to see a new, a new C-suite the chief identity officer, where an executive is looking across business units and driving these kinds of policies and, and participating in these kinds of technology decisions. I think the other thing that we're going to see is the opportunity of the UK leading the way in open banking. To its great credit, to the forcing functions of Brexit and commercial need, the financial service industry, in all of its glory in the UK, is developing open banking solutions in standards and in schemes 
in a way that is leading the world. I think that offers an opportunity to create this global ecosystem and maintain leadership here in the UK. And lastly, I think that we'll begin to see as much of a generation push as any, a new way of thinking about consent and agency, a way that is doing away with the toss agreement where I'm one and done. Thank you, Don. So just join me in a hand for Don. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, I'm just going to announce our next speaker because it's not until 1.30. So we've got Tamar Eliam. She's coming on at 1.30. She's from IBM. She's going to be talking all about trust and identity in the cloud. Now, that sounds um, a, a little bit out there, but I think she's going to be talking about data breaches, how trust and identity can be done, and how you can secure your data in the cloud. So that's at 1.30 here on this stage. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.